Okay, my name's Ian Allison. Uh, I'm involved with the Australian Antarctic Program, and I've just had the opportunity to be involved with or participate in one of the IPY projects. Uh, this is a project in the Antarctic dealing with Antarctic sea ice, and it fits into the IPY honeycomb diagram round about here. <laughs> uh, just a little bit about the project. It, it, like all IPY projects, it's an international project, and it involves a, a lot of small components, but two major parts of it are two research cruises in icebreakers to the Antarctic in the uh, early spring season. One operated by the Americans in the, their vessel Nathaniel B. Palmer, uh, chief scientist of that was Steve Ackley. And the one I was involved in as a participant was in the Indian Ocean sector of the Southern Ocean on the Australian research ship, the Aurora Australis, and a project led by Tony Warby. This was a project looking at the physics and the ecosystems in the sea ice zone and the way they link. Uh, it builds upon work we've been doing in the Australian National Program for a number of years, but IPY has given us the opportunity to expand it, <coughs> link it to the US effort and to other national efforts. Uh, we did this cruise in September, October, um, just around about the time that sea ice in the Antarctic is at its maximum. And during the voyage, we had about 60 scientists on the vessel and involved some, something like eight different nations. This is a map of what we were trying to do. This is a, a satellite image showing the typical ice extent uh, at this time of year, around about October, in the area uh, south of Australia, south of Western Australia, actually at about 120 degrees uh, longitude. We were looking at the, at the physics of the sea ice zone, what the thickness of ice is, what are the processes that get the ice to grow that thickness, how the ice interacts with the atmosphere and the ocean, and very importantly, how the ice influences the animals and the plants that live in the sea ice zone. Uh, so the links between the ecosystem and the sea ice itself. The plan for the voyage is to do a transect into the ice uh, on the eastern end of our study area, in towards the coast, uh, and, and we'd stop the vessel occasionally, get off, do a number of measurements, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, we deploy, shown in the yellow circles or the red crosses, arrays of drifting buoys, uh, satellite tracked buoys that would be placed on the ice uh, and would move as the ice drifts, and the whole ice in this area is drifting from east to west at speeds typically of about 20 kilometres a day. Once we'd reached the coastal area, um, the objective was to make some measurements on what's called fast ice, that's uh, ice that's fastened to the land, land fast ice. Um, measurements there that we, we can use to help calibrate satellite data, uh, traverse across to the west and then do a repeat uh, transect out of the ice zone, again occupying a number of stations where we make a series of measurements. That was the plan. The, the actual cruise track was a little bit different because although we're in a, an icebreaker, we, we can't just go anywhere, so part of our route was dictated by the ice. But effectively, uh, we achieved what we wanted to do, or we very much achieved what we wanted to do. We came into the ice on the eastern end. Um, the small triangles in this diagram show where we made our measurements on the ice <coughs> and we exited again on, on the more western side. We deployed two arrays of drifting buoys, and as, as I'll now explain, we did a lot of measurements on the ice. One of our basic measurements was to establish a transect, um, typically 200 metres long, this one's only 100 metres long, in which we make a number of basic measurements of the thickness of the ice and the snow. Uh, we'd also study the properties of the snow in pits dug in the snow, we'd study properties of the ice in cores extracted from the ice along this. And these measurements were used to calibrate um, measurements we'd made from the air, uh, measurements we made using radars, and measurements we made using a remotely operated uh, vehicle that uh, operated in the ocean underneath the ice. You can see a hole in the foreground there surrounded by cones. That was the access point where the, the ROV was put in under the ice and uh, traversed by itself, you know, 
controlled from the surface under the ice, measuring the thickness, measuring the biological properties in the water and the ice, uh, radiation and a whole lot of other parameters. Uh, in, in that picture, there are various people along the line starting to make the measurements we routinely made. So the basic observations we get there allowed us to define what the ice looks like in two dimensions. And sea ice is not a flat, uniform slab. You get a lot of definition. The, the ice moves is moved by the wind and the ocean currents, slabs of ice raft up on each other, so it's very irregular and rough. And it's very difficult to measure the thickness of ice, and it's a thickness that determines a whole lot of climate-related properties and, and, and ecosystem properties, so it's a very important fact, uh, you know, very important uh, parameter, but very difficult to, to measure remotely. And these observations were helping us to develop ways of measuring ice thickness without having to drill several hundred holes. At the same stations, oops, what am I doing wrong here? At the same stations, um, we also had a lot of biological parties and oceanographers making measurements of the ice ocean interaction underneath the ice. Uh, a lot of cores were collected to look at the algae that grow within the ice uh, during this period period of years, uh, there's a bloom of algae in the spring which are later released into the water and help seed a, a very large algal bloom that occurs in the late spring as the ice goes away. And this algae is the basis of most of the, the, the life forms that live in the sea ice zone. So there's a lot of work on that, there were work on the trace materials, the trace metals in the ice and the nutrient properties in the ice and in the underlying water column. Uh, the little diagram there just shows the amount of biomass, which is essentially just algae, in the cores that were extracted from the ice. And there's generally, that the number along the bottom is the number of the station we occupied. And generally there's an increase in the biomass with time. This is just a, a seasonal effect, that as we get more light, it's starting to get growth of the algae in the sea ice. One of the other things that we were doing was making a lot of airborne geophysical measurements over the ice. Uh, obviously with the ship we're very limited how much uh, territory we can cover. The aircraft allows us to extend our measurements a lot. The aircraft was equipped with a, a radar system which was being trialled for making measurements of the thickness of the snow on the sea ice. Uh, it took aerial photographs of the, the ice underneath so we could determine some something about the nature of the ice flows, the ratio of open water to ice. And it had a, a scanning laser altimeter in it that really allowed us to map the elevation of the ice above sea level. And because ice is fle floating, if we know that elevation above the sea level uh, and we know something about the density of the ice and snow, that's an assumption we have to make, then we can get a picture of what the thickness of the ice is because it's floating in hydrostatic equilibrium. Uh, we're also making measurements of the infrared radiation that tell us the surface temperature of the ice. And the, that aircraft allowed us to extend the measurements over a very large area. So the coloured lines you see here are the routes that the aircraft flew. Uh, the general sh ship's route just follows the centre points of those coloured lines, but, but the aircraft measurements gave us a much greater coverage over the whole area of the sea ice zone. So that's a brief summary of what we did on the program. We're still to analyse the results. Uh, and I just point out, like many of these IPY projects, uh, work like this, field studies like this, involve an awful lot of people. And this is a photo of most of the people involved in this project, the scientists, the field assistants, the ship's crew, and the aircraft crew.